Time for Type 40, a Doctor Who podcast from the Spacebook for the Fandom Podcast Network with me, Dan Hadley, Birmingham's king of the geeks, regular host, designated driver, mouth runner and all-round hopeless case, ready to deliver some Doctor Who conversation. Once again, here on our free speaking, big thinking show for everyone, whatever decade or century you started watching, reading or listening along to those timeless adventures of our hero, Doctor Who. We talk about it all on this show and there could even be a few laughs along the way. So come and step into our TARDIS in this 60th anniversary year on Type 40. (laughs) Yes, here we are. Once again, traversing the corners of the Hooniverse itself, the the multi-Hooniverse, maybe even this time, for a first word on a brand new project, one that uh, it could be an idea to keep an eye on and an ear open for. And I thought that an ideal person to uh, come together with me back in the console room to talk about this would be we this guy. It's been a little while, so I'm delighted to bring in my mate, the filmmaker and screenwriter, Mr. Ian David Diaz. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Hi, Hi mate. Good to see you. Yeah, How's it going? Good to see you. Yeah, I'm all right. Just uh, you know, doing the usual nonsense, shooting the stuff usual. and editing stuff, and you know, usual, <laughs> usual nonsense. <laughs> usual for you, but not for the yeah. rest of us. So you're deep into filming now, aren't you? On the sequel to your award-winning production, Rebecca Gold, aren't you? Doing night shoots, day shoots. You're out in the, out and about in cafes and street corners, aren't you? Wherever they'll let you get away with it, really. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I am. And unfortunately, I don't have the, the 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 right budget for what I want to shoot, but so you have to work around it. So here you go such as life and all that sort of thing but yeah that's what i'm doing at the moment so hmm. well it'll stretch you creatively won't it that that's the thing and you're a very resourceful filmmaker aren't you have to be don't you <laughs> is there is there any other kind exactly exactly <laughs> Well, dedication. You've certainly got a lot of dedication to your art mates, and this is something that I've always admired about you, your enthusiasm and, and well of energy that you managed to muster up for these projects, particularly when you're doing night shoots and, and things like that and trying to rustle uh, actors and everybody else together. It really is very, very impressive. But I think it's the kind of, the kind of language that uh, a particular a breed of person speaks, and I can only think that I know what you're talking about, but I know that our guest on, the, on this edition of the show, I think he knows exactly what you mean because he's also deep into a new project now too uh, before we we bring him on and talk about that let's let's set the scene a little bit this is uh, this is our new mate this is uh, writer and actor and director and i'm guessing he could be a bit of a doctor who fan too this is philip roy welcome to type 40 philip hello Nice to see you. Hello. So, yeah, it's a perfectly normal thing to do, isn't it, Philip, to get together with two total strangers via the wonders of the internet and to talk about about Doctor Who and time and space and all that kind of thing. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, very, uh, it's quite the thing that we do, isn't it? Uh, Just talk about our favourite shows and, um, you know, the intricate details of those sort of things. (laughs) <laughs> so although people haven't seen you or heard you on this show before, they may have seen you on the screen, have, haven't they, in some of their favourite shows? Because you are an actor. And how long have you been acting for? Uh, it was about 10, 15 years? Uh, more towards the sort of 10 mark, really, although I started doing more background essay roles because obviously um, I'm based in Cardiff and um, there's an awful lot of filming going around on down here and around the southwest bristol way so um so yeah i've done i probably had my foot in you know a fair few of them poldark merlin stella casualty doctor who everybody's been on casualty right (laughs) oh oh yeah that's a standard line everybody's been on casualty (laughs) so who were you in poldark then what were you doing there um in the first series i played um the sort of second lieutenant to uh, Richard Harrington's captain um, mm-hmm. in, I think, the second episode. It was a party scene. And then this scene that you're, this uh, picture you're going to, um, that's when uh, Mr. Poldark decided to enter the the um, the world of politics. And, oh, uh, yes. 
yeah, so I think that's later in about the third or fourth series. So yeah, that's me there with a with a lovely wig on, uh, not quite uh, agreeing with what um, <laughs> was uh, proposing. You don't look too thrilled, Philip. It has to be said. And those wigs—they look a little bit itchy. What are they like? Uh, not too bad. That one wasn't too bad, but um, uh, yeah, there was a few of us had to wear the wigs, and some people got away with their own hairstyles. But I think mine was mm. my hair was probably a bit short at the time. <laughs> Ian, I always think that these wigs look exactly like the kind of things. When my mum used to make our own jumpers for us, when I was a kid, she would knit these jumpers out of the, the wiry wool. I don't know where she found the stuff, but that's what those wigs always remind me of. You were also in Sherlock yeah. too, weren't you? There, you, there you are with Martin yeah. Freeman. Yeah, that was the episode with uh, Toby Jones. Um, mm. So it was nice to work with him as well. Um, yeah, it was... It was uh, it was a, 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 it was quite a good um, education, really, to the way that they film. Because normally, what happens is the the essays get sent off set um, when they're setting up. But with this scene, because it was a set, they would just push us behind the set so we could watch everything on the monitor. So we we literally saw the whole yeah. process of how it filmed, how they do different takes. Um, so so I learned a lot that day, and uh, and obviously working with uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, Martin Freeman and Toby Jones on one show is, you know, not, not the worst job in the world, is it? Well, no, Toby, no. Toby Jones was in Doctor Who and then he got Doctor Strange. So you had two doctors there. <laughs> two That's connections true. to the doctors there, yeah, basically. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Looks a bit looks a bit chilly there, there though, mate. I don't mind telling you. And uh, but uh, what's going on here? This looks a bit more gothic. Yeah, this is a this is probably the first um what I call a feature film um, that I did. Um, and it's it's a based on the true life story or, or the true crime story of um, the Green River Killer, who was a serial killer in America, killed a, a, an astronomical number of women, really. I think it was pushing oh. 40 to 60 women. Wow. Um, and he, he came after Ted, he came after Ted Bundy had been arrested. But the story is about how Ted Bundy helped the police who had caught him to catch this serial killer. And it's the whole, and I think this is where the idea of, of Silence of the Lambs came in, where oh, you, I see. You, you use a serial killer to catch another serial killer because they understand how their twisted minds work. Um, so I play a chap who's based on uh, the real life um, FBI chap, Robert Keppel, who caught Ted Bundy and then, and then helped oh, uh, to yeah. catch the Green River Killer. Oh, so that's um, a big part then. It was. It's a, it was a, you know, it's a low budget film straight to DVD, mm. but um, uh, I, I auditioned for it and, um, and it was quite a, quite a big part. You know, before that I was doing short films and student films and this mm. was a major step up and there was, there was an awful, awful lot of dialogue. In fact, I'd say out of all the, all the roles in the, in the, in the film, I had the biggest chunk of dialogue because the main detective <clears throat> who was played by um, an actor called Mark Homer, who was in EastEnders for many years, he would he, he would ask me a question. So, you know, how do how do serial killers work? And then I would give a page of dialogue and then yeah. he'd ask another short question. And then I'd give another paragraph of dialogue. I mean, in the end, they, they cut a fair bit of what we filmed out because it was, it was just too basil exposition if you know what i mean but um mm. but yeah it's on uh, it's on amazon prime and netflix if anyone wants to watch it it's called bundy and the green river killer so um if you've got an hour we'll make uh, sure netflix. we'll make sure we put we'll make sure we put some links to some of these in the description to the to the video and the show notes to the podcast as well so in some respects being being an actor and some of these roles that you've played it must be a little bit like traveling in space and time yourself you're playing goodies playing bad guys sometimes in the yeah. present sometimes in the past sometimes in costume sometimes not it, how does that how does that feel you're sort of living out a, a boyhood fantasy or is there something a lot more artistic and deep and meaningful about it or is it somewhere in the middle well i just think it's it's always nice to be someone else for a few hours um, <laughs> oh that that's me and panto that's my panto character um yeah it's nice to be someone else and and um I guess, you know, even as a kid, I was doing um, impressions and making up little characters, yeah. um, funny voices, um, with, you know, when I should have been probably knuckling down and doing some homework. Um, so, so I've sort of, uh, I feel like I've got a little bank 
of characters inside me. So when I start, <laughs> start reading a script uh, or for a role, there's usually something I can I can pick up on. And obviously, you, you obviously put a, a whole chunk of yourself into it. But but there's all yeah, there's always something that that I can uh, I can tap into. Um, mm. I, yeah, I love I, I love playing characters, especially the bad characters. That you know, the, they always say the bad characters are the most fun. Um, They're right. But it's but you know with Panto obviously you can be really over the top. But obviously if you're playing a if you're playing a bad character um, in a film, you know you don't want to be chewing the scenery or trying to outdo the main actor. And and you have to you have to always come back to the idea that bad characters normally don't think they're bad. You know they they might be ruthless and they have a reason to do things, but in their minds they're 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 justified, and, yeah, and you're so, right. you know you've got to keep that in 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 your mind, I think, um, and then you tend to get a truer character, I think. Mm. Um, you spoke so, a moment yeah. ago there about Panto. A lot of people do liken rather unfairly, I, I think, Doctor Who to a, a a kind of Panto, don't they? Because mm. it is it it is sort of cartoon like in a sense, isn't it? The version of history that we get in Doctor Who. It's not it's not really as thinly sketched as Panto is, but it's obviously a certain. It's almost like a cod history. It's kind of boiled down, isn't it? It's yeah. it's an entry level entry level history is how I always look at it. But of course, you you were in Doctor Who, weren't you? So where were you? What what, what episode was this? Ah, right. So this is uh, the fiftieth anniversary episode. So exactly. 10 years ago um this is wow. day of day of the doctor and um i'm sure the fans will remember that the daleks um attacked a planet called arcadia or one of, one of the gallifrey outposts of arcadia and um there's a scene where after the aftermath in the aftermath of the dalek attack there were a few survivors and um i was one of the survivors which was nice mm. <laughs> uh, so, so that was a that was a two a two day night shoot. So we filmed this um, while they were waiting for um, it, waiting for it to get dark. Mm. So they they picked a few of us and uh, and we were lucky to uh, to play Dalek survivors. <laughs> did you did you get to see the Daleks? Were they on set as well? Yes, later on in the night they were. Um, obviously, a lot of the scenes we were sent off, but. You know, while we were, while we were waiting to do our the scenes next, we could see the Daleks. Yeah, so all, all the boys were there, the usual uh, Barnaby and uh, and and um, a couple of the others. Mm. But um, <laughs> that, yeah, great. Was that a bit of a bit of a dream come true, being next to the Dalek, or did you tap into some sort of oh, light and fear from your childhood? Absolutely. Um, you know, I think as much as I loved Doctor Who as a kid, I, I like every other child they were fascinated by the daleks just just by the way they move you know that that shape and the way they move um it's they are truly iconic um really are mm. but that wasn't that wasn't the only place in the 50th anniversary that people may have sort of seen you is it you were there right at the end too weren't you where where are you here what's going on here playing one well, of the doctors <laughs> I, yeah, I, i'm playing uh sylvester mccoy yeah the this, McCoy is, seven this is extraordinary and an, it, this was an iconic scene wasn't it right at the end of the production where all the doctors are sort of lined up and it's it's uh, special effects heavy isn't it and, and there they all are seemingly every incarnation of the doctor all together and there were you in the thick of it. I think a lot of us wondered how on earth they they'd done that. This is ten years ago, isn't it? But now that that was you, wasn't it? So, yeah. Tell us about about this, about the whole process. How did this come about? Well, Doctor Who is always very secretive. So, if you get a call from your agents, and normally they'll say, "Do you want you know?" There's two days on Casualty, or there's a couple of days on Sherlock. But sometimes they say, oh, are you available Wednesday? And you say, oh, yeah, yes, I am. And they just say, oh, we'll get back to you. So they don't want to tell you that it's Doctor Who, just in case yeah. um, you start spreading rumours that, you know, they're filming Wednesday. Um, so they said, uh, yeah, do you, um, we've got a couple of days <coughs> you uh, doing doubling work. And uh, 
the only thing is, will, are you happy to have your sideburns shaved? And I said, yeah, but what is it? And they said, oh, 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 it's um, it's Doctor Who. So I said, well, yeah, of course. And um, uh, I knew that they were filming the anniversary special and I'd heard that the Zygons were coming back. So as, yeah. as, soon, as, I heard, as soon as I heard the word doubling, I, I in my little fan mind, I, which was whirring, whirring away, um, I thought perhaps I was playing one of one of the actors that had been cloned by the Zygons, you know, so you see them, you see them from the back, but also from the front, yes. um, you know, that, that was what I, you know, doubling work. That's what I'm playing. I'm playing one of the, one of the actors who's been cloned by a Zygon. Um, and then the reality was we, t I turned up at the BBC. They sent it. They normally send you into the canteen for, to wait, to be picked up by one of the, one of the crew. And um, there was a couple of, um, other essays that I knew, uh, a chap called Mickey Lewis, who does an awful lot of creature work. He's played Cybermen, Daleks, all sorts. Yeah, of... I recognise the name. Yeah, yeah, and Mickey's done a, done an awful lot, uh, and a few other people. And the first thing he said to me was, "Which doctor are you playing?" Uh, oh, interesting. <laughs> uh, my jaw dropped, and I said, "What are you talking about?" He said, "Well, we're all playing Doctor Who. We're all playing the old Doctors who." You know, some of which are, are dead or don't look like they used to back in the day. So, again, immediately I started thinking about which doctor I would probably be. And I I narrowed it down, certainly by by my height, uh, which is about five or eight, um, to either Patrick Tratton or Sylvester McCoy. And, yeah, it was Sylvester McCoy. Um, and the interesting thing was that the the costumes are the original costumes uh, that they had on display in the Doctor Who experience at the time. So oh, I wondered about had, that. Yeah, so we actually had to wait till 5.30 until the experience closed for them to port the costumes over to us. Uh, meanwhile, we, we'd gone into sort of hair and makeup, so they, they seemed to find some sort of wigs for us that uh, looked... Uh, reasonably the same as the as the actors, uh, and we all waited. We all waited around in dressing gowns um, until the costumes came over. Um, because that really one looks a little bit like the one that Rick, Richard Beckinsale had in Porridge, doesn't it? That's really surprising that the BBC would <laughs> yeah. would would um, wait till instead of actually getting you another costume or or another costume made for this because it's the fiftieth, right? And it's really yeah. it just goes to show how cheapskate the bbc is really let's face it that's just terrible yeah um, in my opinion of course you know yeah i suppose i suppose it's just a it was just a really obvious a really obvious solution to them rather than having to get all the essays in measure them run up a costume yeah. they just think hey guys can we borrow the the costumes from the from the experience for a couple of yeah, hours but you had to wait till it finished though see that that's the thing that gets yeah. me it, yeah. To be fair, the experience was right next door to the studio. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I know, <laughs> I know, but still, yeah. though, still, you know, I mean, but by the anyway. time, but by the time, you know, I mean, I think our call time was about two in the afternoon. By the time, yeah. by the time they wait around, pick you up, put you through hair and makeup, yeah, and also they they put these, as you can see, they put these little letter set dots, dots on, yeah, uh, so they could match up the the, the photos from the original cast. Mm. Um, and the funny thing is, when you actually watch the episode, um, we were told not to move around at yeah. all, yeah. because because you it, it would alter the, the face then. Yes. Um, but if <laughs> but if you so it looked, oh. it, I think a lot of people thought it was some sort of static photograph. But if you it actually did, watch, yeah, it looked actually, like it was. Yeah, it's crazy. But if you actually watch the clip, you'll see um, the second Doctor does this with his fingers, albeit lower. Uh, and if you and if you look at my doctor, I'm doing something with the collars, um, or the bottom of the yeah. collars. Um, now there was there was no direction in this. It just happened to be that the chap who played uh, the second doctor, Richard Roberts, knew a bit about Doctor Who, and he knew about the Trouton Doctor, and obviously I knew yeah. a bit about Doctor Who. Um, so you know, we were able to give a little bit more of a characterization to those particular doctors. Mm. Um, but I'm sure if you know if someone had if if someone had said to the to the agency, I'm a massive Doctor Who fan and I know loads <laughs> about Doctor Who, you've basically 
killed any chance of, of getting on Doctor Who because they don't want they don't really want people who are fans because they always worry that that the fans will be so pent up about it that they will start dropping little yeah. little bits about the plot. I mean, we while we were waiting to um, to do uh, to be for the costumes to come over, there was there was a chap there who was filming and he was he was in costume as a Time Lord guard and he knew nothing about Doctor Who, but he said, oh. Um, he said, uh, he said, they told me that this this um, this character called Omega is 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 the baddie in it. He's coming back. And obviously I knew I knew who Omega was. Now, when he watched the episode, Omega is not in it at all. That's something that the production yeah. put out as, as a little MacGuffin. So if people did tell people. Everyone would think that. It, a few of the room with crafty. the was coming back. Yeah, very, very crafty. crafty. Because as I'm sure you're aware out here in the fan community, we think that there are red herrings put out there. But until very, very recently, it was a case of, oh, no, no, they, they wouldn't do that. But I think Russell T. Davis said last year that he, he had been and would be having fun with the fan community as if to say, yeah. I know exactly where you go and I'm going <laughs> to, and you won't know it's me and you won't know what's true and what isn't. You know, he's a very, very playful man, is he? A very... Yeah. <laughs> Very much like that. Yeah. I think the way I see it, it's all, it's all, uh, it's all in good, good jest. It's all part of the fun to to uh, get people talking about the show, isn't it? I remember those rumours about yeah. Omega. Now you mentioned it. Yeah, well, that's that's where they came from. Probably this chap who, <laughs> who started <laughs> them all. But, um, there's always one, isn't there, Phil? There's yeah, always one. There's always one. But but like I say, Doctor Who is is very very secretive, and I, and it's hard to get onto as well. You know, there's there's people who've done a lot of background work and and have mm. never managed to get on. And and I think I think when you get onto it, if you do a good job, or it certainly seems to be the case, then then they would call you back. So you would get you know one or two episodes um, a season. And then I think when it when it changed to um, the new production crew, um, Chris Chibnall and Jodie Whittaker. The, yeah, the old point, new production I, I, crew. The old new production yeah. crew. Yeah. At that point, I I I never got any um any shout outs for for Doctor Who after that because it was an I suppose it was a new a new a new era and a new new people looking to book essays. Yeah. It reminds so, me, uh, Ian. Yeah. What I'm thinking of, Ian, is that Robert De Niro movie, the uh, Meet the Parents with the Circle of Trust. Do you remember that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I suspect it's very like that. <laughs> I can understand why they do that, though. I mean, obviously, they want to try and keep it secret and all that, but I can understand it totally that why you wouldn't hire Doctor Who fans and stuff like that. And, you mm. know, you're, I think you're very lucky to be part of the 50th because the 50th mm. is, is the one thing that loads of loads of the fans remember and cherish just like the five doctors we cherish the five doctors big time the same thing with the 50th as well the 50th wasn't perfect nor was nor was the the five doctors but the 50th is the the latest one that we can we can honestly truly say that doctor who was right up there when it came to the zeitgeist and it came to the the fans and everything so it's great that you were part of that and um you know i i i would have mm. i would have i would have walked through nails to get that part but uh, <laughs> but you got it <laughs> so there you go <laughs> yeah it must be yeah. a lovely memory because obviously david Tennant and matt smith they're they're two people that this fandom do hold in in very high esteem we've got a lot of affection for both of those gentlemen mm. but john hurt is and i'm sure that the that that those two guys wouldn't mind me saying that john hurt is a was a genuine genuine uh, screen legend wasn't he? he? And and possibly Britain's greatest living character actor, certainly at that time. So as as an actor, were you very conscious of that? Or do you find yourself quite easy to distance yourself from that after you've been around around a few bigger, bigger names and things? I think I think it's a bit of both. I think, you know, um, when we when we were brought into the studio in costume and they said, wait here. Uh, David and Matt are just finishing off a scene so we could see David Tennant and because it's quite a big studio the one set it's uh and we saw David Tennant and, and Matt Smith just finishing off something and we were all waiting in a lineup uh, at the bottom end of the studio and then David Tennant just looked over for some reason and did did a, a real cartoon comedy take double take and started nudging Matt Smith and you know, say, there's the doctors, there's the doctors, look. 
Mm. Um, so when we came on, David Tennant was like a kid in his sweet shop. He was taking photos. He said, oh, I've got to have photos with you and all this sort of stuff. Um, <laughs> and then they brought on, so, uh, and then they brought on um, uh, John Hurt. And it was just amazing because he is, he is and was, a, like you said, a huge film star, a huge icon. Um, and they just positioned him by us and we sort of gave him a, you know, obviously you don't, you can't just go up to them as you would want to and go, I'm oh, your greatest fan. You know? Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You've got, you've got to try and be professional. So you might um, yeah. give him, give him a smile or say hello. Um, how are you or whatever, but, but you know, you can't, yeah, you can't of course, go of course. you know, you know, can I have your autograph? I loved you in alien. You know, that sort of thing. But people um, like that have an aura, don't they? But afterwards, yeah. oh, did yeah. you, did you not get a chance after they no, did the last take? No, no, because what tends to, you know, I, uh, I think a couple of us got to shake his hand, but, but mm. you know, they pretty much whisk, 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 whisked him away. I think. Um, wow. Oh, what do you mean? The actual BBC staff and the director. Or well, the they, they were just, uh, yeah. I mean, obviously once, once he's done his scenes and they say, right, that's a, that's a wrap guys. Um, you know, the, the director might go over and say a few words to him and at that point, you know, mm. uh, he, he sort of goes off, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, that's, it that's is what really, it is, you know? Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a shame really, because, um, you know, it's kind of disrespectful to the, to the, um, to the standings and, you know, and the other actors in the mm. room It is kind of, you know, I mean, it will take nothing for a couple of seconds to say, you know, you know, um, Thank you to David Tennant or whatever, and thank you to the to the people that were helping and stuff like that. Because if they didn't say yeah. that, then it's a bit it's a bit crap, isn't it? Really, let's say did did so did the well, yeah. okay. The question I need to ask you is: Did the yeah. first say thank you very much for your for your help, guys? You know, that's a wrap. Blah blah blah. Oh, yeah. Or did he oh, just yeah. got whisked away, and that was that, and say thank you, and get out. <laughs> Basically, yeah. did they do that? No, no, no. But, but yeah. you know, the, the, uh, I think the director Nick Curran, I think was directing it um you know mm. he was he was um very personable and thanked us all and right. said it was a good job but but That's but nice. you know i mean it was 10 it was 10 years ago and i, and I was full of excitement yeah. at the time so i probably <laughs> don't course. remember it quite as it was but um, <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming but, but, that. but you don't you don't get a lot of time you don't really yeah. get a, a lot of interaction because they're moving on to the next thing you know so sure um, but i'm assuming I, that um uh, this is a guess here now was the um the museum set next to that set like you were saying they were just finishing up on something was it uh could you see what they were doing could you see what set oh, they no. were on no no um the uh the, the the i don't think i think they have uh more than more than the one studio so so when we went yeah. in there's mm. the standing TARDIS stud, um, set, mm. uh, and obviously you see you see it from the, from the outside, so it's all the you yeah, know yeah. the wood the wooden frame, um, yeah. and then um, then and in the in the distance we could see the the the, the TARDIS police, police box, and they and Matt and David were just finishing up something there, mm. and then they they so there wasn't anything else really. In that studio at the time so so if they had constructed the museum set it would probably would have been on another in another all right studio. i got you i got you uh, i got oh, a yeah. feeling they had two studios at the time yeah because it's such a big production yeah so they so they would always have you know the tar the tardis set there and mm. then used for, for for whatever but i but i think they had two i think they used two studios at the bbc at the time yeah well, that's great um, that's great yeah so the studio was i mean the set was very very basic basically they 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 built a little a little wall painted it black and then they filled it with dry ice um and obviously the wall helped keep it in and then yeah. they positioned us in a, a a v formation and if you watch the episode when you see the the the, the doctors from the back we're in one formation and then when they film it from the front we're in different positions Oh, so it yeah. doesn't quite compute, but also, but obviously it is a dream sequence in in in, in a long yeah, way. So it, is. so it doesn't yeah. really matter. Um, yes, you can mm. see from the photo there. You can see the dry eyes. And then what they did, which was quite interesting, is they said, "Right, guys, you're all looking up uh, as if you can see Gallifrey, which has been lost." 
and they, I think they pointed uh, with a laser pen to a, to a little bit of masking tape on the wall, <laughs> and uh, and they said, you know, obviously this is a big moment. You know, Gallifrey was previously lost. Uh, you you know, it's your home planet, which you haven't seen for for a number of years. Um, and they actually piped in some um, some gentle um, gentle atmospheric music. So it, oh. it did give a little bit of the emotion, you know, which they don't normally do. Yeah. They, you know, you're normally there to say, right, imagine, imagine you're, you're feeling wistful about your, but no, um, uh, they did pipe in some, some very sort of um, uh, emotional music, actually, and it did get it your did senses moving, a sensory experience. Yeah, yeah. it was, it was, very it was nice. an interesting way that they filmed it. Mm. Um, and then obviously they, you had, which you can see from that photo, there's a, they had a huge, um, huge camera on a crane, and yeah. they just come, come closer and closer to to David and Matt to get their expressions, you know, their wistful yeah, expressions, and also, so obviously it helped them as well, you know. For, for um, mm. I mean, it didn't really make too much difference to our faces because we were going to have photographs of the original actors <laughs> put on, but, but obviously for for for, mm. for David uh, John Hurt and, and um, Matt Smith, you know, it was important to get get them in, in some sort of emotional state. I'm sure what they would a, be fine without the music. because what, ex- what a fabulous experience, Phil. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. As I said earlier on, this isn't necessarily why you're here to talk about to talk about Doctor Who with us this time. Is it because you're involved in an exciting, fun new project that's definitely going to be of interest to to you? If you think that the BBC simply haven't been getting enough Doctor Who in front of our eyes <laughs> this last few years, and I'm thinking of Ian De- David Dears in particular and pretty much everybody out there, I'd say so. Keep listening for where we're going with that what, who could be involved, the whens and the wheres and the whys. But in the meantime, I've got to remind you that each and every edition of this show, past, present or future, is just a tap or two away on the device of cho- your choice, but only if you know where to look. There's well over 100 reviews, previews, interviews, geek outs and deep dives with all our regular panellists and some pretty awesome guests. We know there's something for every fan, in fact, over at type40.podbean.com. More about that later on, as well as a couple of minutes where we will make contact with a matrix of all knowledge that we call the Fandom Podcast Network for a word about all the other cult conversations going on across all the other shows over there. Okay, I think we've beat around in time and space for long enough time to get stuck in to the real reason why you're here and the tremors that are coming out of the vortex. Let's get multiversal. Let's stare into the temporal schism and see what or who exactly pops out when we pull to open. Yes, uh, it goes without saying, as Doctor Who fans, we'd ideally like to see as much of the Time Lord on screen as possible in any year, big anniversary year, however much any of us may enjoy the expanded media stuff, which I know that you don't, Ian. (laughs) Ah. Seeing and first hearing or imagining is always going to be the fullest of Doctor Who experiences, isn't it? Practically practically since the beginnings of organised fandom, many of our number have got, frankly, a little bit fed up with waiting for uh, just a little bit more and found making their own unofficial take on the series and, and this character, this mythology, an itch that it's impossible to resist giving a good old scratch. So we're here with writer and director Philip Roy to tell us more about one such project an exciting new venture with a very evocative title indeed so this is doctor who meets the scorpion that's a, a title and a half isn't it so i don't know what to talk about first three who what what's the what or who is the scorpion phil you're responsible for for all of this so where where should we start what is this project well a couple of years ago i was um I saw a, a, an advert for a um, on, on a, an actors forum um, mm. for a for a fan film, and they were looking to cast Doctor Who in their fan film. They'd done some Torchwood fan films, and they wanted um, uh, the Doctor in it. 
and uh, so of course I was very excited. Sent sent off my uh, my CV and got a little script. Um, I did a, a self tape. Um, and but I I pushed the board out a little bit, so I I had a couple of Daleks in it and a Cyberman um, and some monsters. And the idea was that the Doctor walks into almost like the the cafeteria on Star Wars, and they all turn around and what and you know notice he's come in, and then he he sort of has gives a little speech to them. So that's what I that's what I did. Um, sent it off and um, and didn't hear anything. And I thought oh, that's a bit disappointing. I really went the extra mile for that you know yeah. i mean actors actors are always used to being um rejected but but you know at the lower end of the of the budget you would normally get a, a look well done but you didn't get the role and i didn't hear anything so uh i left it a few weeks and said you know any feedback on this chaps and they said oh we're, we're just finishing off one of our other films so it's on hold for a bit we'll we'll be in touch so then Months turned into about a year and then COVID hit. So while I was at home, like everyone else doing nothing, I, I messaged them again, said, look, you know, is there any update on this? And they said, oh, where are you? Where are you? And I said the link again. I, and they said, where are you based? And I said, oh, Cardiff. And that was the last I heard. And I think obviously because it was no budget, no no pay, um, I think they, they, they were worried about the expenses of moving someone back and forth cross country to do weekends filming. Mm -hmm. So I didn't hear anything else. Um, and um, I mean, that's, that's not a problem, but I, but I started thinking, well, look, why are you, why are you um, worrying about this? You know, when you could, you could do your own fan film, you know, enough people you've acted, you know, enough good actors, you know, enough crew. So this kernel of an idea started. Um, and then I was, um, again, doing a bit of work for my uncle as a paint and decorator because my, you know, filming had stopped during COVID. Yeah. And uh, he had two um, large factories um, next to each other, food production factories. And, and the one factory at the back had these big mixing machines and, and with big retro Thunderbirds buttons. And I thought, oh, God, this would make a brilliant <laughs> Dalek control room. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I thought, well, yeah, why, why not? And then in the other factory, I, I was, I was painting some um, markets on the floor at night, and um, yeah. parts of the, the factory looked really dark. And I thought, oh, this is spooky. This would make a brilliant horror film. And so I started. I, I did it the opposite way of how I'm sure Ian writes his things, is that normally you write your story and then hope to find the locations which fit it. And what I did was think I've got two great locations. How can I write a story around it? <laughs> so, so that was the cool of the idea. And then um, I think it took, you know, I got most of the way through it and then it just got oh, most of it in terms of the script, it got put on hold for a bit. And I thought, come on, Phil, you really need to knuckle this down. And then maybe we could start filming this next year. So eventually that and um, about a month and a bit ago, we did, we actually put, something on to film for the first time um we did a weekend of filming with with dialects um which would be the pre-title sequence um put a few photos up started up the the, the facebook site and um yeah. it seemed to garner a very good response um a lot of people saying oh this this is as the feel of the 60s films because we used um, we used movie Daleks, and then in other scenes we use classic Daleks. We we haven't used new series Daleks. Um, so so yeah, so we had a good a good response to that. And then um, about a week and a half ago, we we started filming on the main story um, in one of the other factories at night. So we did a night shoot, and um, again got some really good footage from that. So. After two sessions, really, we've got 15 minutes of footage. And I got a feeling that this thing, I've, I've said it's a 60 minute fan film, but I've got a feeling when it adds up, it may be yeah. a little bit over that. We might be looking at a feature, sort of, uh, a feature length fan film. Length film, yeah. <laughs> now, um, a fan film for anybody out there who doesn't know, who's unaware of this, is a film or video. This is how it's defined, a film or video inspired by a film 
television production or a comic book or video game created by the fans rather than the official copyright holders or creators and filmmakers have traditionally been been next to amateurs more often than not although plenty have been produced by professional filmmakers perhaps to use on on show reels and things like that isn't it Ian? that's why yeah. people sort of i say cut their teeth but maybe experiment a little on such productions don't they with what they can do both with actors and locations in the way that philip's described them i suppose yeah, a lot of Star Wars, there's a lot of Star Wars fan films out there that are absolutely brilliant, you know, and special effects. You know, obviously, kids today, they're a wizard at special effects and just as good as some of the Hollywood productions. So there are a lot out there. It's a shame, really, because most of the Doctor Who fan films um, compared to the Star Wars ones or the Judge Dredd ones, which Judge Dredd, they brought Judge Dredd ones out there. They're not as 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 um, as good in production wise as uh, usually it's Americans making them sort of thing. I think so, it's kind. Yeah. I think it's kind to say, Ian, to acknowledge that they they vary in in quality. And, yeah, uh, and in yeah. length. because <laughs> we've yeah. all seen them, haven't we? And <laughs> yeah, there's a Superman one that's just come out. There's a Spider-Man one that's just come out recently. You know, they you know you can tell they're amateur films, but you know, but it, it, there's nothing wrong with that. And 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 no. uh, fans fans love making um, you know um, yeah fans love making fan films, and I love watching them. Tell you the truth, so you know, when Phil gets one, his one out, I'll be watching definitely. <laughs> well, I wondered about about the whole notion of a fan film. I wondered had it started with Star Wars, but it turns out it hadn't. No, it the very hasn't. first yeah. the very first fan film came out in 1926, which was a, a, a kind of a homage to a series of movies that were called Our Gang. And this original yeah. fan film, it's it's been preserved. There's only one copy of it in existence, and it's locked away in South Carolina's News Film Library as an artifact of interest itself and, and lots of people who went on to, to work in film or entertainment in one respect or another people who were aspiring to do so they did they cut their teeth making fan films including a teenage Hugh Hefner so Philip did you ever imagine yeah. that you'd be following in the footsteps of Hugh Hefner oh um that's a loaded question oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, yeah, I don't think. I, yeah, I didn't actually. No, no I, might bought, have been... I might have bought a couple of his publications over the years, but. Uh... <laughs> but didn't um, then what's his name from Doctor Who? Didn't he? Didn't he used to be in a fan film? The guy, what's his name? The one who writes. He wrote. Um, he wrote for New Who. He he was. Oh God, what's his name? He's an actor, but he's also a writer. He was in Sherlock. Played Sherlock's brother. Oh, Mark Gatiss, oh, Mark yes, he Mark did. Gatiss, he was in a fan yeah. film before, he, and a Doctor Who yes. fan film, in fact, before he became, yeah. you know, in the real Doctor Who. So, and my, yes, my friend, right. yeah, my friend used to do fan Doctor Who films. Oh, well. that's right. Your friend, your former colleague, yeah. Yeah. he was involved in the Stranger series, he wasn't was, he, from BBV, yeah. very yeah, high yeah. profile fa fan Doctor yeah. Who series. Yeah, he was. So, I mean, you know, it could lead into bigger things, you know, that's the thing. And and it, and I always take my half to people who actually complete, because you get a lot of people going, oh, I want to make this, I want to make that. And they All it is is just talk. But but I, I, I know how difficult it is to make something with hardly yeah. any money. So once they complete it, it doesn't matter how good or bad it is. I always respect them and I take my half off to them. And I think, you know, you've achieved something that a lot of people talk about but not do. So do you know what oh, I mean? So it's a, it's a it's a it's a it's a good thing. That's what I say. Well, let's anyway. let's start with let's start with the title, Doctor Who meets. I mean, that's a that's a very how can 60s. I put this? Yeah, very kitsch, very sixties. It it does chime with the the Doctor Who and the Daleks title, doesn't it? Doctor Who, D R mm. Who. So is this something that that just leans in to your own personal tastes, Phil, or is it just a matter of fact? It's sort of born of the circumstances and the realities of the production that you can make. Yeah, I think with the title, um, we knew the the, the main bad guy in this or the main adversary for the doctor was a character called the scorpion um and so i mean i was thinking of a title you know would it be doctor who and the scorpion as it would have been on a target novel um <laughs> and then i then i i remembered um the the project that tom baker and ian marta were trying to get off a film in the 70s called doctor mm. who meets scratch man and I thought, oh, what if we had Doctor Who meets the Scorpion? That would be, that would be mm. very retro. That would be a talking point. That would be something that people could uh, latch onto. Um, 
And I think the feel, the feel that we're trying to get with this film is um, obviously we have we have a pre-title sequence with with the Daleks, um, and we've got movie Daleks, like I said, and classic Daleks. Um, so there's an element of the Cushing movies which is referenced there, um, and then it's there's there's a, a an idea of more of more. We've, I think what we're trying to achieve is 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 a flavour of the seventies and eighties um mm. series rather than going new who if you like um mm. uh in the in the beginning of the um of the episode i'm very conscious we, we've seen where right away i lose the sonic screwdriver and i'm very mm. and and so i ne i didn't want that as as the oh we're in trouble i'll wave the sonic and everything will be all right which i think tends to tends to to be to the detriment of new who mm. um you know that the doctor in the old series you know didn't might have used the sonic now and again to to unscrew something but it wasn't to just quicken up the plot a little bit yeah. yeah yeah and i i i like the idea that the doctor has to think around not having a sonic you know so he has to get out of situations um, without pressing a button. Is that yeah. Pertwee's one? Is I think Pertwee? it is. Yeah. yeah yes, one, it yeah. is. Mm. Yeah, that's that, that's the one that he um, he blew up the Drashigs with in the Marsh. Well, not, <laughs> so not, not the exact you've... one. But... <laughs> um, this is a kind of a Dennis Waterman project, isn't it? You're you're. It is. <laughs> is in the sense that you're 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 writing it, you're directing it, and you've cast your yourself. Did you sing the theme? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I I did I did uh, have a little go at uh, rearranging the theme and putting a few few things on there. So, so yeah, it is. It's very much a Dennis Waterman project. I mean, I didn't <laughs> I didn't intend to direct it, um, but I knew hmm. I had certain ideas about how I wanted certain scenes to look and certain camera hmm. angles, etc. Um, and I thought, well, if I if I've got a almost impose myself on a, on a director who might have different ideas that's immediately a clash yeah and i think i think as a as an actor stroke director in a production you have to have a lot of trust in your dop um so i storyboard um all the scenes that we do i run through with my dop what i want and what i want to achieve and, and certain shots and angles and invariably he will say okay why don't we do it like this and we'll come up with something better mm. or or enhance my idea. So I think we work very well together in that sense. But as an actor, sort of director, you can't be behind the camera. You, you can't be monitoring how, the, how the, the scene is shot. So you have to have confidence in your DOP. You know, and sometimes I'll come back and look at how he's filmed it, um, you know, most of the time. But that does hold things up a lot. But a lot of the time, you know, if we're doing multi angles, as long as I can see the angle, I'm happy in the way that he's filming it. So, so yes, it, it wasn't a conscious decision. And, and again, I didn't intend to write all of this. I I, I had some ideas, mm -hmm. and then I came to a a, a, um, a brick wall, if you like. I spoke to a, I asked a friend who was a published author um, if he could give me some pointers. Um, he was very busy at the, at the time, so time was moving on. And while while I was waiting for him to come up with some idea where the plot could go, I was waking up at three in the morning, couldn't get back to sleep, and and the ideas were worrying. So it sort of it sort of came came to me, and and in the end, I I, I managed to hopefully put together a, a story which which works and engages. Mm -hmm. um, and I think probably as a, as a as a, a, a newish writer. I I went down the ter the Terry Nation route in that um, you 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 can put in a lot of um, almost like an odyssey you know getting from A to B and all the things that get in your way to keep things mm -hmm. interesting so so you don't so someone doesn't particularly like oh I don't really this plot doesn't engage me there's always something else a little bit like the idea a of the parallel plot about a, a countdown or a plague or a bomb that could go yeah. off yeah. 
Yeah, just just something that somebody loses. gets radiation poisoning. That's usually how it works in a termination story, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. No, funny enough, we didn't have a we haven't got a, a radiation. But I, I get the impression we, that you're you're um you're doing it like the '70s style, stroke the the movie style kind of thing. That's the aesthetic you're going for, yes? Yeah, yeah. Um, mm. We don't have a lot of um, CGI effects. Obviously, mm. we'll have we'll have Dalek blasters. Yeah. But but we're trying to do most of the stuff uh, in, in in camera. camera. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so rather, you know, we may have to have a CGI spaceship, but all our TARDIS shots are being done with a with a a, t a, a, a chap who makes these brilliant uh, twelve inch TARDIS models, and mm. uh, he, he can put CGI backgrounds on them. But when mm. it's a bit like the old Harryhausen films, when you see yeah. a model, when you see a, you know it's real, even though it might be a little bit claymation jerky, it feels real mm. when it's CGI. And if you don't have the budget to do good CGI, I find it can mm. let let it down. Yeah, so, uh, so, I yeah, mean, we're, we're um, trying to do that sort of thing. So you've got uh, the props, you've got the locations, you've got the costumes, and then your vision the starts, and then mm -hmm. your vision starts to well, and then your entire vision starts to come together of what the flavour, as as yeah. Ian's rightly sort of circled there, what the flavour and tone of the of the piece can be. So, do you did you shape your script your script afterwards to to match that in any way? Is it is it a process, an organic process, where you can sort of think, okay, well that didn't quite work when we were shooting that bit. Maybe I should go back to the script. And how does that feed into your own portrayal too of the the central character of, of the the title character of the doctor because obviously each actor that's played that it, it tom baker always says that it's largely the same character but i'm not necessarily sure that that's that that's true what's your take on that character as well i think i think there's an element of a running element of the doctor um he's slightly eccentric uh he's He's uh, he's brave. Uh, he he knows what he's doing, or he, he hopes he knows what he's doing. Um, so I think there's an element of the Doctor running through through each character, and then I think what each actor hopefully is able to bring to it is their own their own a little bit of themselves. You know, obviously there's a huge chunk of Tom Baker in Tom Baker's Doctor. There's a huge chunk of John Pertwee in his in his Doctor. Yep. I would say maybe Patrick Troughton, as a character actor, um, there's maybe less of Patrick Troughton mm. in it, more character. Um, but I but I think, yeah, I think um, I think the character is there. But I, but obviously I've I've written I've written the Doctor's scenes um, or his dialogue with with a view to the way i want to play the character mm. um and i and i again i i've never i've never put this what i feel is is maybe how you would call the new who character this this idea of the doctor as a who thinks of himself as uh, in some ways not a god but you know, I am someone in the universe. People fear me. That sort of thing. A higher I, being uh, with a greater responsibility. Yeah, I've gone back to the, the, there's 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 a a line in um, in our script where uh, one of the bad guys confutes me, and he and he says, "Who are you?" And I said, "Oh, oh, I'm I'm the Doctor. No, no one important. You know, mm -hmm. because because I don't want to give this. I don't want this guy to be to to sort of know that he's bigger than he is. Obviously, he is." Um, but but I like the idea that this guy just comes in, bumbles his way, uh, and and tries to sort out the the situation. Mm. So 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 I think, like I said, it's more it's more of the of the of the seventies eighties character. Yeah, I did wonder With, because in these images that you that you've circulated through social media, he's got a very definite look. There's something of the of Dennis Waterman's character from a show like The Sweeney or, or Gene Hunt, yeah. from Life on Mars. And I did I did wonder was that was there any elements of that? Not necessarily, not literally that you're going to go around yeah. chinning people out and and downing pints. <laughs> but was it going to chime Ooh. with with a seventies mood and feel and what? heroism kind of was then what a, what a, a patrician character perhaps would have been like then i'm thinking more of the way that john thorpe played regan come to think of it rather than 
Well, why would you say that, Dennis Waterman? I think you're insulting the man. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, no, joking. No. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> yeah, I, had, I, mean, <laughs> I, I hadn't <laughs> thought that. Perhaps, perhaps I should insist on pints uh, on yeah. set, instead of <laughs> water box. I mean, to, to be honest, like like I said, I I think I brought I brought a, an element of myself to this character. Not now. I'm, yeah. I'm an ex mod. Probably still a lot of me as. You can just see, see, see the t shirt. Wow. Hey! Uh, Fantastic. I love, I love the Who. I love Northern Soul. I love Motown. Mm. And my look uh, has always been a bit of the seventies. You know, I've got a f- yeah, f- f- probably far too many leather jackets from the seventies and um, <laughs> loud Brilliant. white white collared shirts. Yeah. So, so when I was, you know, I suppose when you are thinking of playing the Doctor, the first thing you think of is oh. What's my look going to be? You know, what am I going to wear? Do you know um, what's interesting, though, is that I've watched a lot of fan Doctor Who films and it's made by m- mostly kids. OK, mm. mostly kids, twenty, maybe people in their 20s, whatever. Never, they, ne- they ne- I've never seen a Doctor Who fan film with someone, well, once with someone in their 30s, whatever. And it's whiskless obvious youths, that, Ian, whiskless yeah, youth. Well, that, but it's obvious that you are a huge fan of, of classic Who. I mean, to, to quote a thing, classic Who. Yeah. And so that's where your interest lies. But if you see some of the, the, the fan films on YouTube, you have all these young guys playing it and they're definitely stuck in the new Who world. The way they play the mm. doctor, the way you know, it's all it's all very David Tennant-ish. It's all very that. But yeah. it, you you seem like you're aiming for Troughton, Pertweed, uh, even a bit of Tom Baker and stuff. So that's that's refreshing. Do you know what I mean? It's very refreshing. I agree. So, yeah. Hey. Well, I well I think you know, like you say, there's a there's a lot of fan films out there, um, mm. and I thought if I'm gonna make a an impression on this uh, this area. Mm. It needs to be something different, and and um, so yes, I did want to give the feel of of the seventies and the eighties because, I, like you said, it hasn't been done. And obviously, I'm an a, a older actor, mm. um, um, so so that works for me. And and the idea that the Doctor dresses in seventies leather jackets. Well, if you can go anywhere in time and space, if you can go to the mm. ends of the universe. To him, everything, every every piece of co- every piece of clo- uh, clothes or clothes are either futuristic or retro to him. Right? Yeah. Mm. Because no, you know, if you say, "Oh, you're dressed, like, you're dressed like the seventies," you know, well, no, I, I I dressed like this because this is an era I like, and it's not yeah. retro to me. It's this might be the future to me, or it might be the past. But well, you know, if, in, if in I truth, dressed... I guess in truth, they the the actors dressed. <laughs> The time that they were in basically so you know i mean it's it's, it's always going to be something different but i do like yeah. the idea that you're literally channeling the 70s doctor and and the you know and obviously a bit of the 80s doctor as well that's fantastic i think that's really cool so yeah, when we look at the yeah. at the pictures and we I'm talking and to phil here yeah. it's very really clear that it's all it's all gels together doesn't it yeah. it feels like a complete vision not just for the character but for the for the show for this yeah. production yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I, I mean i mean a lot of um yeah. a lot of fans like me and old farts like me and Dan. <laughs> uh, okay. yourself, dear. <laughs> we're, we're, we're gonna obviously the... gravitate towards this aren't we but there are a lot of there are a lot of new fans you know uh, as as dan uh, would would clarify on type 40 we have us me me simon and dan and we're the classic who and stuff and then we have charlotte who's new who and stuff like that and and so i don't know you know but i still i think it's a really good idea to go back to you know the Tom Baker era, the John Perwid era, and and it was all about story then, wasn't it? Because obviously they couldn't afford to do certain things, so it was yeah. the written word, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I don't think I think if um, if there are any new Who, new Who fans who watch it, they will still get the f- the flavor of New Who because mm. because just just the, the quality of the camera work, the quality of of of, of the, the, the the how how detailed that the, the that the the screens are now um mm. and uh, you know and, and slightly some of the ways that it's shot um we i mean classic who was always a lot of mid shots um we do have that but we do have close you know some close ups which is nearer to the yeah. style of new who so yeah. so i don't think i don't think it'll be that jarring to anyone who's who's used 
to uh, you know new who. I, I think mm. I think there'll be something for everyone in there, and yeah. um, and, I, and I think I think I think that's uh, you know I like yourself, Ian. I don't knock anyone who gets out there with a camera no. and starts mm. for the love of this program starts mm. filming. So so the fact that there's a lot of young fans who play the doctor. Um, and, and I've got to say, I, I've watched a few of them, and mm. some of the some mm. of the CGI stuff that they do, I'm really blown away by. I think, wow, that's mm. that's outstanding. Um, but I think what can let them down is obviously budget. Not that I have a huge budget, but I I managed to wangle some good locations. Um, mm. And I think the other thing that sometimes lets them down is is that they they're obviously enthusiastic. They've got a lot of friends who are enthusiastic, so they will. Get their friends to play the companion yeah, or, or, yeah. or the arts yeah. nemesis, and and then the know, actors they're not, yeah. yeah, yeah, they're not they're not they're not trained actors. Well, no, yeah, you know, a lot of the people in this are my friends, but they're all actor friends. They're all yeah. people who've done stuff that I've picked them because they're good, great actors, mm. not because oh, you're my mate. Do you want to be in this? You know, yeah. it's it's. The acting That's pretty much how you work as well, isn't it, Ian? That's how you drive your well, productions. Well, yeah. I mean, show. sometimes you don't have a choice, so I have to I have to rely on my directing skills, and because I know I've been doing this for for a very long time, I know what I can I, I can trick an actor to do something so it looks like they're doing one thing but they're really doing something for me and they don't know it so you know there, <laughs> there are certain ways of, of of talking to an actor and and bluffing them really to to give the performance that you want so i know how to do that quite a lot but i do agree with you phil that they just get their friends in you know and they're you they're terrible the, the, the thing that gives it away though is they shoot someone like this and there's a big white wall behind them and it's like that yeah. that definitely pops up <laughs> You know, cheap, cheap. This is cheap. You know, well, no, no, no set yeah. dressing or anything behind them and stuff like that. So anyway, yeah. well, as you said, everybody needs their their friends around them, don't they? Do, they? Yeah. You know, na- na- you know, call as a call to arms, and every doctor does need a companion, and it's no different with you in this production, is it? So, so who's who's this? Who's the doctor's best friend in this production? <laughs> Hold your horses, Ian. Get a glass of water for Ian. Glass of water for Ian. So who's, um, who's this? this this character is called Jenny, and she is uh, played by uh, a young actress called Mandy Rose, who I worked with on a music video a few years ago. Um, and she is a phenomenal actress. Um, mm. Her show reel is is incredible. So, um, yeah, very and very pleased with with the way that the filming is working out. Uh, you know, I've watched some of the rushes and. and um, I mean, it's the same with a lot of actors, but but uh, the camera loves her, if you know what I mean. She she's very she's very photogenic on screen, um, mm. and and hopefully I can I can match that <laughs> as the doctor. There's, uh, there's, there's but it's a nice it's a nice dynamic. Yeah, there's nice something to make. It's a very Perry looking about her though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, um, I'm pleased. <laughs> so, what's the character's name? And without spoil, I don't want to spoil your your film at all. But is she travelling with the Doctor when it when the story begins, or do we meet this character? What's what's her name? Do we and do we meet her during the process of the story? Her name is Jenny, and she meets the Doctor um, at the start. Uh, or oh, we've also got the pre-title sequence with the Daleks. And then it start. Then we have the title sequence, and then it starts a new a new story, if you like. Mm. Um, and the Doctor meets her in a spooky warehouse at night, where she is trying to find out more information about why her brother has gone missing. And she um, knows can I ask you a things. question? How, yeah, where did you get the Daleks from? Uh, did you know someone who owned them? Well, there's there's um, various Facebook sites for people ah. who who have and have built their own Daleks. Mm. Um, so it was a difficult one. I I didn't know whether to to reach out and book the Daleks first and then try and <laughs> get the locations um, because, as you can see there, that's that's a corridor set that 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 I had to build with with uh, one of my builder friends, mm. and he's a very busy man. So. I had to make sure that he was available so we could build it the day before we shot on the weekend because obviously it's a working factory. So, you know, we didn't have weeks to to build this thing and leave it up. I mean, it went up on the Friday. 
it was the set was scratched on the Sunday, ready for mm. people to come in and work the next on, on the Monday. Um, so so I had to get I had to get that sorted. So I knew I had two weeks and then I had to try and book my Daleks and hope that I could get them. And luckily I did. There's there's um, uh, there's a couple of chaps who've got very uh, good movie Daleks in uh, just up the road for me in Kafili, which is about 12 miles up. Some of the guys came a little bit further. We had one Dalek come from the, the, the planet of the Daleks Dalek there. That chap came from Liverpool, uh, wow. Joe, and he, and he was there for the Saturday and the Sunday. So he stayed, he stayed with me. Uh, mm. I mean, look at that. That just, that's just, that could be straight out of Day of the Daleks, couldn't it? It's oh, great. Yeah. Such an iconic Absolutely film. great. Yeah. Um, Fantastic. Another, a couple of the other guys came a little bit further afield. Um, about two hours um and one and the other dalek that we had in it another classic dalek which is a silver and blue um dalek was actually featured on i don't know if you saw it um harry enfield did a sketch about doctor who and um, oh last year yeah yeah and paul, paul whitehouse played a sort of william hartnell type doctor i did and, see that uh, and one of those daleks was was one of the daleks that we had mm. um so so yeah we 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 were lucky we we had great daleks the movie daleks because they're so big um the chaps that were inside them powered them by uh mobility scooters mobility chairs wheelchairs yeah which was fine because we didn't have to ha we didn't need them to move at any great speed in the dalek control room when the two patrol daleks as i call them were chasing the doctor down the corridors they needed to move at a little bit more of a pace and um so they were they were old school where you pedal with your feet sit on a shelf pedal with your feet so they could go a lot faster so um i think if we'd if we'd had uh daleks with mobility mobility chairs uh chasing the doctor down the corridors it might have looked a little bit slow mm. uh, it might not have worked um but i mean and these 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 shots are, are, are great uh, you know i wanted to have a rover man in it um so i so i built that helmet <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um but but i think you know it's not screen authentic to the films but but it you know that's a rover man if you've seen the Christian oh it's films, near right? enough <laughs> phil it's, it's near, near enough, enough. Yeah. There's just a lot of atmosphere in these in these static shots like, that you've been I like sharing. The, I like the Daleks, the colour and everything. It's quite nice. Well, that's it. It's it, it's it's colourful. It's colourful. Mm. The pre-title sequence is is very colourful. Very, it could be something out of a sixties film. And then when you hit the main story, it's a little bit more new. Who, if you like, you know, it's it's mm. in a spooky warehouse at night. There's something going on. Um, yeah. But yeah, so uh, it's 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 going well. It's going well. Um, so tell me a little about the rest of the cast. I mean, who, who did you manage to convince to wear the, the bin liner type suit of the Robo Man <laughs> and your homemade helmet? And who, well, who is the Scorpion? Who's <laughs> playing the Scorpion? Do we get to even see the Scorpion? Or is that also me getting getting way, way ahead of myself? We do get to see the Scorpion. Um, the chap playing the Robo Man um, is, out of all me saying that, you know, I, I hired people because they were actors, I did actually hire one of my friends because I thought he would be the right height and built yes. for for us looking at but it uh the robo man is is basically a a background extra uh yeah, role. so there, there wasn't any dialogue needed so so it's perfect for that the mm. scorpion i knew i had to have someone who had uh a slightly alien look because he is an alien shall we say um so there's a chap who's with the same um acting agency as myself and he uh, has a what you call a USP, a unique selling point in that is in that he is six foot five. Um, so he towers above the doctor. A big unit, uh, Phil. A big unit. A big, yeah, a big unit. And I think once we get him into some alien makeup, he is going to look very good, very good indeed. So I think he'll be a great nemesis for the doctor. Um, but then he has his sort of second lieutenant, if you like, um, who, who's played, uh, the character's called Taylor, and he's played by uh, Brian Smith, um, who I think you put a photo of him up earlier uh, in, the, in the, the night shoot that we did. And he is oh, yeah. a, he's, a, he's a great actor. I've worked with him before uh, in a stage play. 
uh, and he has a he has a great voice. There's certain actors that have got great voices. You think of Richard Burton, um, and Brian has a distinctive voice like that. So he will bring a lot of gravitas to that role. There's yeah, there's Brian there. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm very pleased with my cast. It's not a huge. There's not a huge amount of characters in it. It's quite a small ensemble of cast, um, but they are all good. All good cool. actors. And obviously, yeah. you've said you've spoke very highly of their skills as actors. Are they necessarily, if not Doctor Who fans, then genre fans, or are they just hungry to act? Well, funny enough, Brian is a is a, a Doctor Who fan, uh, same as myself. So whenever we meet up, we meet up, we we talk Doctor Who invariably. Yeah. Um, Mandy, who plays Jenny, she's not a Doctor Who fan, but her father is. <laughs> He's a massive Doctor <laughs> Who fan. Oh, dear, yeah. so, oh god! <laughs> so, so, so I think I think some of I think some of that osmosis has, has sort of moved into her. So 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 she's very enthusiastic about it as well. Um, I think Lucas, who plays our our character Scorpion, uh, isn't um, what you call a fan, but obviously knows. Has watched New Who and 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 likes that. So so yeah, he's certainly on board f- for, for for the the role and what it entails. Obviously, if if you're in makeup, there's a lot of um, sitting around. It's quite it's not always the most comfortable thing. It's quite hard to act in uh, in in heavy prosthetics. But he seems to be up for it. So uh, especially yeah. if you're doing a night shoot as well. The night yeah, the night. Not- I hate night shoots. Oh, mm. well. Hate them. I, I, you know, I've done a few, um, and I wasn't looking forward to it. But actually, that you know, we we started at eight. It went dark because we needed it for the darkness, mm. uh, simply because I couldn't really get up on the roof and black out the the windows. Mm. Um, so we started around nine ish and filmed till four a.m. Uh, both days. Overran on the Saturday by about half an hour. Um, mm. And, and to be fair, to be fair, the actors, the, the energy <coughs> levels were, were still good, you know, at four in the morning. Um, yeah. <laughs> and and uh, and we got some, like I say, we, we got some really good footage. Um, there's a there's a there's a lovely stunt in this, which I I can't tell you oh, about no. because it would, it would be a spoiler. No, we don't spoilers. want any spoilers. We don't yeah. want any spoilers at all. I, I'm positively chomping at the bit to, to see this just from <laughs> what you're telling us, from the images, everything that you share, because every couple of weeks there's a round of, of new things on your social media accounts, yeah. and it all seems to be coming to life. So I think you're showing us and telling us just enough so far yeah. to, to whet the appetite and get us invested in what this could be. Be. We're going to talk a little bit more about this production, about about the whens and the hows, and, and maybe tease a little more from Phil as we get stuck in to, with our with our conversation a little deeper. But uh, we've got a sting of a different kind coming up now, delivered by our mate Kev. He's going to whisk us all away on a whistle stop tour across the Fandom Podcast Network for a reminder of all the other shows out there covering all the other franchises that a lot of us, a lot of us geeks, are into as well across movies and TV and comic books and everything else here on the Fandom Podcast Network. We'll see you back here in a couple of minutes for more about Doctor Who meets the Scorpion from Phil here. Don't go away. We'll be back in a couple of minutes. Thank you for listening. We hope you're enjoying this podcast. Here are the other great shows on the Fandom Podcast Network. Culture Clash, where we discuss the latest in entertainment and pop culture. Blood of Kings, our show covering the entire Highlander universe. Couch Potato Theater, we celebrate our favorite movies. And Time Warp, our fandom flashback show discussing a year in movies and our favorite retro movie, TV, and pop culture topics. Good evening, discussing all things Alfred Hitchcock. Hair Metal Podcast, we cover the rock metal music of the 80s and early 90s. Type 40, a Doctor Who podcast, discussing the time-traveling Doctor Who universe. Lethal Mullet, an action film podcast, covering the 80s, 90s, and beyond. Also, check out the Lethal Mullet Network for more great podcasts. What a Piece of Junk, our Star Wars podcast. Making Treks, a Star Trek podcast, with a deep dive into the final frontier. The Fandom Show. Our Fandom Podcast Network live YouTube show discussing the hottest topics in fandom. 
the True Believers MCU podcast discussing the Marvel Cinematic and Television Universe, Union Federation, our Star Trek, and the Orville show. And we're proud to welcome the BQN Network to the Fandom Podcast Network. Please visit our friends on the BQN Network, a Star Trek Universe podcast that also includes your favorite topics, movies, history, superheroes, and more. You can find the Fandom Podcast Network on YouTube. The Fandom Podcast Network is also on all major podcast platforms. The Fandom Podcast Network audio master feed is on Podbean at fpnet.podbean.com. You can find the Fandom Podcast Network on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can email us at fandompodcastnetwork at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening, and remember, respect others and enjoy your fandom. Yes, we've teased and tantalised you there, and we can even clothe you too with merch to match all of those shows, including Type 40. If you head over to tpublic.com, search for the Fandom Podcast Network, and that's where you'll find a store full of all the team colours for all of the podcasts on everything from T-shirts and phone cases right the way up to enormous tapestries. Seeing is believing. Treat yourself, treat your other selves. All goes to support the Fandom Podcast Network into the bargain. So every Body wins. I am still here with Ian David Diaz and Philip Roy, Doctor Who himself here. We've just had the lowdown on Doctor Who meets the Scorpion. Little teases about what's to come and the cast and some of the logistics of this production that, that uh, Phil is bringing to life for us in little bits and bobs. It sounds to me like, Phil, that th- although your script is complete and it's sort of locked in, you are kind of rolling with the the punches and the realities of of low budget filmmaking and i think what a lot of people who could be listening and watching this out there might be wondering is okay we've been teased quite a lot when do you think we're going to get to see this finished product um like you say the, the realities of low budget filmmaking are that you can't throw a chunk of money at it um and That's true. uh nail nail down your crew and your actors so um all the actors have day jobs all the crew have day jobs uh, i have a day job um so it's it is a little bit ad hoc as and when um filming so far has been on weekends there's certain scenes that we i know we won't be able to get the locations on the weekend it'll have to be weekdays um so the the, the simple answer is i don't know it, i would i would hope that by the end of next year, after post-production and f- principal filming is finished, it would be out, hopefully, for the the, the, the 61st anniversary, but it's not going to be ready for this year. I can, I can yeah. tell you that now. Um, and funds, of, obviously, funds are sl- quickly diminishing. Uh, um, so they w- so I think, I think the next step is we've got 15 minutes of footage now. And some good footage. I think we need to put out a teaser trailer, um, and then go down a little bit of the of the crowdfunding route. Um, I think that's just the reality of any quality mm. product that's more, more than a, than a ten minute short. Um, you have you have to you have to throw enough money at it to to, to make it a good product. Um, and if you want a good product, you need good locations. You need sets. Um, you need uh, people working behind the scenes to edit it and put decent sound onto it. Um, so, so I think, yeah, we will have to do the crowd fund route. Um, but to be honest, if I was a fan and I, I, I saw and I saw the sort of teaser trailer that we're going to put out and the sort of footage, and you can tell by the photos, you know what we're trying to achieve. Yeah. I'd throw, I'd throw a tenor in any day to see that realised. Um, and, if, and if we get enough fans doing it, then the production will move forward at a faster pace. The reality is if we don't, then I have to work, get in some money and then film and then work a bit more and get in some money. So it's that it's that sort of, of idea. Course. And hopefully, you know, with any fan film, the one thing you can't do is monetize it. 
So um, the moment you try and sell DVDs or something off the back of the film, the BBC quite right will say that this is our copyright. You can't, yeah. you know, if you say this is this is a, a little homage, a little tribute to the, to the programme we know and love, I hope you enjoy it as well. Um, as with all the other fan films, there shouldn't be a problem. Um, but if we crowdfund enough and we get this thing done, um, you never know. It could become like Star Trek Returns, where they crowdfunded enough to do a, a whole a whole season. You know, yeah. so so after that, after this, if they like my doctor and they like Jenny as the companion, if she survives, who knows? <laughs> um, we we they may want to see more, um, and I I would. I would love to do more. Um, I certainly is don't the, think I would be right Are the finances, it. are the finances the biggest hurdle of yours to overcome or, or has there been other creative challenges that you, that you've already overcome in, in shooting what you, what you already have? I think the finances is the, is the main one. Obviously mm. when I, when I look at my script um, as, as writing the script, I've had to think, okay, how do we, how do we do that? How do we make that? If there's a set that needs to do a certain thing or it needs to look a certain way, how do we do it? Um, I mean, luckily I have a bit of an art background, so, so I've got quite a good idea of how, how I can realize these things. Um, but it does, it does <clears> take <throat> money, even, even using the same, the same ideas that the BBC um effects department used in 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 the 80s you know, if you need to build if you need to be, build a transporter well what what can you do out of and a lot of the time it's plywood polystyrene a couple of colored lights and some silver paint um but i don't think that's to the detriment of what we're trying to do because i think i think the fans will get that and actually it will enhance the product you know if, if you did a fan film of the old flash gordon films and all your mm. robots were guys in guys in silver boxes, the fans would understand that that's how they did it when yeah. Buster Crab was in the role, and they and they'll get a kick out of that. If you try and modernise it too much, suddenly the the then it's the not a homage to what they loved in the first place. Exactly. Yes. So so I think I th yeah I would say the budget is 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 the biggest thing. I don't think I think creatively we we can do everything. That needs to be done with this production. The only problem I have, and I can see, is when we do TARDIS scenes. Now I can quite easily create a set of the TARDIS space. What I'm struggling with at the moment is um, we either go down the route of having a TARDIS console built. Now that's that's big money, you know, because it's not an easy carpentry job to do that. Um, or we we try and find someone who has their own TARDIS console around the country and it's portable enough so they, they would be happy to bring it down. We'd give them some money and let us film with it. So, so I mean, that's, that's, that's the only part of the film I haven't worked out in my head at the moment. There's a, there's a fella out there now who's got, for example, the console that was in the Blackpool exhibition. I know that that still exists in its whole. Yeah. So I can't remember where it is, but maybe if you could track him down, it'd be happy. Because <laughs> it fits with yeah. that kind of aesthetic and that time of the mid-70s that you're talking about. But, uh, yeah, does. I don't know where I... he is. Maybe somebody out there knows. If you do know, get in touch well, with Type yeah, 40 Instagram and Twitter, at Type 40 Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> there, there, there is a chap who's, who's taken his, um, his and it's a full size um, 70s Tom Baker console to various conventions. And I did speak to him and said, look, would you be prepared to bring it down to Cardiff and, you know, we'll reimburse you for your time and effort. Um, mm. But from what he was saying, he said it, it's 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 very hard to move because it comes apart in about 16 pieces. And the other thing is it won't go through a standard door. So, <laughs> you know, so, so, which is, so, so I think what I'm off. looking for is someone, <laughs> yes, is, is someone who has, um, someone who has a slightly smaller console, um, yeah. maybe not quite as small as, um, as in the Tom Baker season where it went very wooden. Yeah, the secondary console room, yeah. Um, you, you know, Le when Leela was in it and they went to it, yes, yeah. I don't think I wanted it that small, um, but something was say I don't know two thirds of the size of the the normal six sided console would be great. But, but like I said, I think that's a that's a problem to be solved 
in the future. Uh, both scenes can be done. You know, worst case scenario, we, we, we'll we'll go we'll go to the, we'll go to this this you know someone can set up their console in their own place and, and we can dress the set around that. I don't know. I don't know. But that's that's the only thing I haven't figured out in my mind. All the other stuff is is doable. Doable. Mm. Ian, hearing yeah. Phil talk here about the, the challenges that he's facing and the, the problems that he's solving and the financial question that, and the technical difficulties, the, the simplest of things like getting something through a door, does this chime with you? And have you got any advice here for Phil here about the way to approach some of this stuff? Well, I do, actually. <laughs> um, okay, right. So um, I don't know if you know that um, if you've got – Photoshop um, beta, mm -hmm. you can say, so for instance, say you say you've got the the actual TARDIS um, console. Say you manage mm -hmm. to get that, um, you can literally now you know what Mat Shots is, right? Yeah, yeah, right. Okay, so you can. It's so easy now. It's incredibly easy because of AI. So in Photoshop, a lot of people are doing this. Basically, they shoot in video of themselves. And then what they do is they take a still of that and they put it in Photoshop and they stick it in the middle of a white frame and they tell Photoshop to create what's on the left and what's on the right. And it does it perfectly. It matches the picture. So you say, I want a window on the left. or will create a window, it'll create different versions of the window and you just pick one. Mm -hmm. And then the same thing with the other side as well. So for instance, it depends on what you're shooting. This is a low budget, obviously a low budget idea of how to do this. So say, for instance, the doctor's not moving a lot. He's moving around the console, say. You can create the rest of the set via this way. So you just you create the whole yeah. thing in Photoshop, and then you take it and you put it into Adobe uh, Premiere Pro, whatever it is, um, and then you put that uh, video within that space. So that's one way of doing it. And also, you can also do that as well when you're outside. So for say, for instance, yeah, you're yeah. in a gravel pit. And you want to, you know, a big castle next to it. You can you can do that the same way. As long as they don't go past the line of where the mm. where the photograph is, it you know it will work. And then and then on top of that, with um, Adobe Premiere Pro, you can you can create a shake, which will have a handheld shot in the in in the camera, so it looks like you are actually there. So there's loads of there's there's hundreds and thousands of techniques of how you can do it, but you just have to be clever yeah. about it, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, I'm, I don't want to sound like a know it all. I only learned this recently, tell you the truth. Um, because I have got Adobe package and, and they always update it and they keep saying it's AI this and AI yeah. that. And I'm like, what the hell's this? You know what I mean? And then once I discover it, I think maybe I should try that. So I'm gonna try it my my um, productions uh, going forward. But that's just a, a an idea that you can you can yeah. work around. These with. are brand new advances, that. aren't they? That are changing, yeah. it seems, almost by the yeah. week. It's crazy what AI can do these days. I got a friend that um he wanted Peter Bacoldi to read his Doctor Who story and obviously he can't get him. So he went to AI and the AI imitated his voice perfectly. <laughs> perfectly. You thought it was Peter Bacoldi reading his Doctor Who story. It was incredible. So, uh, oh. and all this stuff is free on the internet. It's crazy. You don't have to pay for it. It's, it's, you just have to find the right program and it will do it. So, so think about that. Maybe that will, that, that can yeah. help you. But yeah. by failing that though, failing that, uh, I think, um, yeah, go to the, if the person has a as a console set, go to them rather than them <laughs> come to you, and and yeah. just work it in such a way that it, you, that could they walk through a door and suddenly they're in London. Do you know what I mean? You're in Cardiff, you walk through the door and then you know they're going to the console. You know, yeah. there's got to be a way of doing it. And also, green screen is as a help as well. You know, to shoot in such yeah. a way that you shoot the console and then you can put it in as they walk in and stuff like that. So it is all doable. It's just that you. I always say to people when you're making a low budget film without common sense is like having a boat without water. Do you know what I mean? So you've got to have mm -hmm. common sense when you're making low budget film. Otherwise you're dead. You're dead in the water. Yeah. So, yeah. But, um, yeah there you go. I mean, yeah. I mean, may maybe we, we go down the route of the, of the sixties films that we don't have that traditional target. Yeah. Interior. Yeah. You could do yeah. that. That's uh that's, that's, a, that's, nice a, that's an option. Yeah, it's an option, you know. So they did an awful lot with black cloth in those films, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> they did. Black cloth or yeah. green cloth. There's one last yeah. uh, image that you've that you've put out onto social media. I just want to talk about briefly because when Ooh. I saw when I saw the image of the TARDIS that you got against the green backdrop there, whilst mm. you whilst you shoot a miniature uh, for the TARDIS in flight, 
this reminds me so much of those very, very, very few, but whenever they were on screen, I think as young fans in the seventies, in the, the Tom Baker era, era, in particular, when the TARDIS was just spinning off into into a starry backdrop. In Hawaii. It, you, it used to help, didn't it, Ian? It used to, yeah. Somehow, it seems so homely, and the TARDIS always looked so small. I, I just the thought thing this is, was wonderful when I yeah, saw it. Yeah, the thing is, though, you could do it that way, but also, again, for free, on the internet, you can find a 3D, um, for free, a 3D TARDIS. And you could have used that yeah. on a green screen. You could have used that. I don't know how, you know, I think some, if you, to get it, really right you can you can you have to buy obviously the, the 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 clip but i mean to do it that way it's just as good let's face it and if he's using um after effects then it's going to be it's going to be fine do you know what i mean so yeah and, and like it comes back to to what i was saying earlier in that in, in that you know even when people see the tardis this tardis flying through space yeah. or or i mean the shots that we're doing now is for the for the the title sequence um <laughs> so 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 even though people know that it's a model yeah the fact that it's there and it's tangible yes i agree I feel like you, can reach out and t- you feel like you can reach yeah. out and I, talk to it. I totally agree with you i'm i'm not a big fan of cgi spaceships and stuff that i i i love star trek when ilm used to create the whole model and they used to shoot it and there's yeah. something tangible about a tangible about it isn't there i agree with you totally phil agree i mean you. i mean you know not not to put too much of a spoiler on it but we are you know that mm. there is a, a dalek spaceship um mm. in one of the scenes and my dalek spaceship i mean we may not go down this route but my dalek spaceship is basically two frisbees stuck together with a light on the top <laughs> and, um you know if like people it. think if people think that's two frisbees stuck on top of each other spray silver it, it doesn't matter it's tangible yeah and it yeah. and it has a flavor and that's probably what they would have done when the money ran out on um you know um face of evil or whatever it yeah, it doesn't yeah. matter it doesn't matter because it's there and it's tangible people forgive an awful lot of that i think people are less forgiving of bad cgi and i think i think probably when it's uncanny yeah, rather, I, yeah yeah i'd rather have a I'd rather have a model that looks mm. like a model than, than cgi which looks very cgi well, I mean, there are a lot of good CGI um, models, uh, uh, TARDIS out there that looks yeah. quite real. It just you just have to know what in, what environment to put it in. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, it's it's uh, you know, as as I said, I think you're you're doing fine. You really are doing fine, and I understand the pressure of trying to find money to actually complete it and stuff like that. I'm mm-hmm. in the same boat um, doing a web series at the moment. I'm in the same boat just like you. So, if I was you. Uh, there's something Jim Carrey said, which I think is fantastic. He said, you know, with faith, um, sorry, with with hope, you can walk through fire, but with faith, you can leap over it. Do you know what I mean? So, you oh, know, yeah. keep awesome. keep the faith, man. Keep the faith and keep going. That's all <laughs> I can say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah we, we, will, we will get there. We will get there. Yeah. We will get there. Doctor Who meets the Scorpion coming soon-ish, soon enough in time and space, basically whenever Phil and his friends and colleagues there can can pull it all together, perhaps with help from you out there. So, Phil, if people do want to know more and see more and, and cover and be up to date with all the, the various steps of the production, as much as you can, you can share that you're willing to share, where mm-hmm. should they do this? Where can they find you on social media? Uh, on our Facebook page, which if they search for Doctor Who, uh, Doctor as in DR, not the full spelling, Doctor Who meets the Scorpion. And if they search on that, they should find our Facebook page. Um, at, some to- at some point, I probably will have to expand my social media, but um, this is a good place to start. And we, we do we do um, we do keep updating bits on there. So, you know, f- follow us on there and you will see how we're progressing yes cool. why why uh, run before you can walk uh, to build it all out modestly modestly so what's the reception been like so far to to this who's who's gone in touch so far oh uh, absolutely fantastic um the 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 response on facebook um has been really good um people are saying oh my god this this could be this photo could be out of the 
the Cushing films, um, other people, you know, other bits saying that that looks fantastic, you know, little bits of the set that we've we've revealed. Um, very, very positive. They they've even to the point where they they've liked my look. Um and you know, there's a couple of little clips on there, um, behind the scenes clips of us shooting with, with some of the Daleks. So uh, I, I think people have um I think because it's so different to all the other fan films that have that have gone previously, uh, and you know this isn't this isn't aimed at the aimed at the new Who look. It's aimed at the seventies eighties look. I think that's that's our well one of our selling points really. Um, yeah. That, that we're, we're we're trying to sort of give a give a flavour of of what was. Um, not necessarily compete with the new. We can't compete with the new series. We we we, no. we can't. We haven't got their, their catering budget is probably more than our budget. <laughs> no, I think it's more than obvious. The flavour of the of the product that you're attempting to to bring together to create this this brand new retro vision of a parallel universe Doctor Who, and to bring this this completely. Uh, fresh take on the title character to uh, to our screens however it may get there eventually i'm sure that this is whetted people's appetites and there'll be lots of people willing you to success and perhaps willing also to put their hands in their pockets and to and to get behind you i, I certainly am going to be all over this i'm going to be following very very closely and I'm, i think we'd like to have you back on at some point as well to let us know how the how the production's going and and some more of the of the, mm. the pitfalls and the joys of uh, of small filmmaking i'm, I'm fascinated fascinated by it all. Ian's always telling stories about various uh, various aspects of these productions. It really is fascinating. And I can't thank you enough for coming and sharing some of this yeah, thanks, Phil. with us with us this time. Well, it's been really, really interesting. Thank you for giving your time and um and and getting enthusiastic about about something that you know I think is going to be a good a good product when it eventually yeah. comes out. I think I think everyone's <laughs> going to enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. And that and that's the old girl starting up and calling time on another edition of Type 40, a Doctor Who podcast. I'll be back with another one soon. Look out for that wherever you found this. It could have been over at the dedicated home feed for Type 40 at type40.podbean.com. Or maybe we rolled up on the uh, on the podcatcher of your choice, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, TuneIn, Podbay, all those various places. We're on the, on the Podbeam app itself very easy to use there and we're on youtube the world's largest streaming platform here on the type 40 channel with dedicated video editions of every single podcast now along with our, our sister show type 40 live that's our weekly magazine format doctor who live stream completely live completely raw where anything can happen anything can be said and often is so you can find type 40 live on the type 40 youtube channel too can't they Ian? yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're still on the fabulous fandom podcast network's master feed loaded up with all those treats for your ears never mind on the weekly it's coming <laughs> you're practically on the daily there over at the fpn so please consider a trip sideways in time for more quality shows right there maybe you'd like to have your say about all of this you can reach out to us through our social media instagram and twitter at type 40 doctor who or email us type 40 doctor who at gmail.com could be you're feeling really brave in that case you can step into the type 40 facebook group too and that's where you'll find so many incarnations of the fan base itself people immersed in the classic series i think the classic series is more alive than ever and you'll find people posting about that in the facebook group along with lots of new series fans too that came along later and i think all of us are waiting aren't we arm in arm shoulder to shoulder as we wait for all new doctor who that's coming soon we promised it's coming soon by russell t davis who knows we're waiting and we're willing it the the weeks are now counting down so we're going to get to see the first new doctor who material in some time and we're all doing it together enjoying the countdown together over in the type 40 facebook group there mm. uh, ian mm. where can people find you on social media and, and follow the progress too on rebecca gold too. Well, uh, <laughs> they can follow me on Rebecca Gold, which is the YouTube channel. Um, season one's on there. I'm, I'm trying, uh, just like Phil, 
I'm trying to complete season two, working around the actors because they all got day jobs, blah, 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 blah. I think Phil has literally told my story. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, it'll be ready hopefully in the middle of next year, whatever, you know. But I'm I'm fighting. Obviously, they can watch my movie Bad Day, which is on Netflix, and they can watch Killing Zone, which is on my channel, and the horror film that I directed was on my channel as well. Um, and I'm on Type 40 on Thursdays. I'm on uh, other channels as well. People seem to like me, so they keep inviting me on live streams. So talk about movies and stuff. It's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, you can you can find me find me here. <laughs> basically and the, and there's a uh, fabulous uh, there's a fabulous rebecca gold account on instagram as well isn't oh there? yes yes there is you, you can follow me you can follow rebecca gold official on instagram i mean i mean i was you know phil's just talking about his problems but i got a problem with the main girl in season one didn't want to do season two so now i have to get another girl to play the main character so yeah it's all it's all up and down and i actually sympathize with you phil more than you think mate more than you think so, <laughs> yeah my, my hat goes off to you because You've gone through, you're going through a journey you. just like me. So yeah. yeah, good luck. Yeah, good luck. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> and right. you can find me on Instagram and Twitter as the Spacebook, wheezing and groaning, ranting and <laughs> raving about all things geeky inside and outside of the TARDIS in comic books, movies, and on TV. Now and again, I flirt with the, the real life, the everyday too, when I do have to come right back down to earth. That is. Uh, one more time, Phil, where can people keep track of, of your fan film, Doctor Who Meets the Scorpion? Where can they find that on social media to follow it through as the as the weeks and the shoots and everything continues? Yeah, at the moment it's Facebook and it is uh, just search for Doctor Who Meets the Scorpion. Doctor with DR. Spelled yeah. DR. Absolutely, absolutely irresistible. Yet yeah, that's it for another one. Uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We always have the time if you have the space here at Type 40. We'll speak to you on the next one. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye, everybody. Bye.